Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Detecting Rejection Without Biopsies. Are we there yet? We're so glad that all of you could join us as we have a wonderful presentation in store for you today. My name is Deanna Fenton, and I'm the Program Manager for the Alliance. Now, we do have just a few housekeeping items to review before we begin today's presentation. For those of you who have never joined us on this webinar platform before, the chat feature is located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Now, we are recording this webinar, so we will not be opening the phone lines during today's presentation. That means that all questions must be submitted electronically using this chat feature. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation is complete, we'll have some time for our presenters to address as many of your questions as time allows. Our registration is currently open for our next webinar entitled Pediatric Organ Donation and Donor Management. That's coming your way on February 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Registration is also open for our upcoming webinar entitled Navigating the Waters of Post-Transplant Nutrition, How to Help Patients Stay Afloat. That's coming your way on February 29th at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can register for all these webinars and more on our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for those of you who may be interested in continuing education credits, we are offering one step C and one nursing contact hour, courtesy of Donor Network West. Everyone listening to today's webinar is entitled to claim these credits. If you're listening in a group, as many of you are, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. It's a very brief online evaluation which will allow you to receive your credit. As a reminder, for nursing, you will have 14 calendar days to claim your credit, and for SEPSIs, you'll have 30 calendar days. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to our moderators, Betty Crandall, who is a retired transplant administrator um, from Wake Forest Baptist Health, and Linda Oler, who is the Associate Director of Quality, Regulatory, and Education at NYU Langholm Transplant Institute. Betty and Linda, we're so glad that you could join us today, and at this point, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Diana. It's my ple this is Betty Crandall. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who will be Daniel Brennan. Dr. Brennan was the Alan A. and Edith L. Wolf Professor of Renal Disease and the Director of Transplant Nephrology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, until July of 2017. He was recruited at that time to be the inaugural medical director and co-director of the Comprehensive Transplant Center at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Brennan completed his undergraduate work at Cornell College in Mount Vernon, Iowa, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. He completed his doctorate in medicine at the University of Iowa College of Medicine in Iowa City, Iowa. Dr. Brennan completed both research and clinical fellowships in nephrology, transplant immunology, and transplantation at Harvard Medical School Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Prior to his tenure at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, he spent several years at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. Dr. Brennan's research interests are viral infections, induction immunosuppressive therapy, pharmacoeconomic and outcomes research in transplantation, and islet transplantation. He has written more than 300 original publications and several textbook chapters in these areas. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Brennan, who will speak on this topic, predominantly focusing on kidney transplant. Dr. Brennan? Uh, Betty, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'll get right into it. This is uh, detection, detecting rejection without biopsies. Are we there yet? So these are my financial disclosures. Currently, detecting rejection is done through a biopsy usually, but there are more and more ways that are being explored, and one of them is by using cell-free DNA. What is cell-free DNA? Well, cell-free DNA refers to the fragments of DNA that are in the bloodstream that originate from cells undergoing cell injury and death. This DNA degrades into nucleosomal units consisting of about 166 bases, and so what's important is that cell-free DNA is cleared from the blood by the liver and kidney and has a half-life of 30 minutes. 
So if you see cell-free DNA, there has to be ongoing injury. And this little description of a capillary or blood vessel shows the blood vessels with the corpuscles and then the DNA helices floating around in the bloodstream. So what do you do when you don't know what something is? You look it up on Wikipedia. So Wikipedia shows that cell-free DNA has been used for paternity tests, early identification of fetal sex, genetic studies for families at risk for inherited genetic disorders, routine prenatal screening for rhesus factor, routine prenatal screening for aneuploidy, and identification of preeclampsia. But I'd like to say that Wikipedia probably needs an update. Cell-free DNA has been used for years to diagnose viral infections. This is how we diagnose CMV, EBV, and BK. It was actually discovered in 1948, so it's been around for over 50 years, 60 years. It is used fairly frequently now in oncology, and that's another form of liquid biopsy. It is being used more frequently in transplantation, and that's what I'll talk about today. So this is just a schematic showing the prenatal testing, where you can use, do a blood sample instead of an amniocentesis. Down on the bottom left is the test for tumor mutations, so you can give personalized uh, medicine and chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And then what you have on the right panel is you can look for DNA, and it's been used now and reported in not only kidney, but heart, lung, pancreas, liver. And you can measure it not only in blood, but you can measure it in the urine. But that's not what I'm really going to talk about today here. Today I'm going to talk about how donor-derived cell-free DNA relates to allograft rejection. So these are a number of studies. There's actually a newer study that just came out, and there now have been, I believe, 24 separate studies with 26 patients where they have been looking at the, at the or more than that, um, uh, many studies looking at the various organs. What you can see is there's kidney and liver, pancreas and kidney, kidney, heart, 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 liver, lung, heart, kidney. So what's very exciting to me about this whole um, a technology is it's not just for kidney, it's for all organs, and the same patterns are being seen. And so what are those patterns and how can you use them? Well, it originally when people were looking at cell-free DNA, they thought you needed to look at, say, oh, say you had a female recipient who got a male kidney. Well, then you can look for the Y chromosome. Well, that's not very practical. So what has happened is that the commercially available test, Alisher, which is by CareDX, has actually uses some uh, uh, some technology that they have they have which is proprietary and which is based on the same type of technology that you use in forensics. So what you can they look at single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, and they look at it. If you can see on the bottom right, you see all the 26 the the the, the 23 pairs of chromosomes, 20 through, 22 somatic genes, and then the X and Y chromosome. And what you can see is if you have your recipient there in blue at the bottom, he will have a number of nucleotides, G, C, A, G, but the heart might differ. So there are similar nucleotides between um, anybody. And you can look at this mathematically, and what you come up with is there might be a difference in this G and T. And you can look at this, and when there is donor-derived cell-free DNA that is greater than 1%, that's concern for injury. And let me show you the data that support that. They come primarily from the DART study. This was uh, a study that looked at DNA in blood for diagnosing acute rejection in kidney transplant recipients. And so it involved 14 centers nationwide, and there are really two parts to this study. There is a scenario one in which newly transplanted recipients would have DNA, DD, so donor-derived cell-free DNA tests at 11 surveillance visits. Visits 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, and 24. Probably come back to that later, because. but what we focused on in the DART study and what is the published data are scenario two in which patients were being followed by these 14 transplant centers and underwent clinically indicated biopsies. And then we obtained cell-free DNA at the time of the biopsy and at one to two follow-ups thereafter over about an eight-week period. So that's where I'll show you what the data are. This is looking at the number of patients that were in DART. Overall, there are 384 patients. 
in the DART um, four cause study group, there were 102 patients, 27 with active rejection, 75 without active rejection. And when you look at the race distribution, it turns out that they're really pretty similar to what the United States was, uh, the distribution in the United States. And that's kind of important because a lot of studies that are done uh, tend not to have the same high percentages of African Americans that we had in this study. Male sex was predominant, about 60%, and that's typical. Age at enrollment was close to 50, and that's about what it is now. And the deceased donor allographs was tended to be um, uh, higher in the, um, in a little bit higher in the active rejection group, but really nothing statistically different, and we see that as well. With, with, during the study of the 384 patients on the left, there was 1,272 samples at the time of the data lock. That's a lot. 165 of the patients didn't undergo biopsy, so they weren't included in this. 290 patients underwent biopsy, but 117 were excluded because 26 didn't have a four-cause biopsy, 48 had no blood sample, whoops, six had inadequate biopsy samples, 23 I had prior allografts in situ. Ah, I'm going to return to that because there was concern when this study was going on. If you had an, a kidney that was still left over and this is your second or third kidney, what was that going to do? Well, it turns out that um, that, that doesn't matter now, but it thought was at the time that this study was done, so they were excluded. That left 102 patients in the main cause, and like I said, 70 patients were in the no active group, but there are 80 biopsies with no active rejection and paired blood samples. So what you have is 27 biopsies in blood samples, and down on the bottom left, it tells you that there are 10 chronic active antibody-mediated re uh, rejection patients, six acute active antibody-mediated rejections with six samples, 11 T-cell-mediated uh, rejection patients with 11 samples. And let's look at the data. So one of the things when people look at this, they, they say, oh, well, those are small numbers. Yeah, but when you get statistically significant data of small numbers, to me that's really significant. What this showed is that if you look at the box and whisker uh, group, and this is important when you look at a diagnostic test, so much there's so much overlap as to be almost clinically meaningless. For me, this is what's impressive about this test. On the left-hand side, you can see no active rejection, and the darker gray bar shows the median level, which is about 0.29% or so. Then you can see the box and whisker, the 95% confidence intervals are 25-75, and you can see that they go a little bit above 1% in the now active rejection, but not many people. And then in the active rejection, you see that the median, which is in the gray bar, actually doesn't, if it barely overlaps with the upper uh, bar on the no active rejection. So that's something that you can take, to, take clinically and use. Look at serum creatinine, which we're left at most of the time. Look how the gray bars completely are the same, and look at the overlap between the uh, confidence intervals. Completely overlaps, and we know that. You can have someone with a normal creatinine rejection or very high creatinine and no rejection. So to me, this is a useful test for discriminating between those two. How do you tell that? Well, you do a receiver-operator characteristic curve. So what this shows is the ROC on the left for the Allosher or cell-free DNA test, and the, uh, and the slanted line, the straight slanted line, is a line of identity. That's like flipping a coin. So what you want to do is have your curve from your study sample to be up as it is on the right, uh, on, the, on the upper left panel, and we'll go into that and compare that to creatinine, where creatinine goes almost along the line of identity. And it's, again, just another way of showing how un, unuseful the creatinine is, and yet that's what we use all the time clinically. So whenever I see a diagnostic test, as a reviewer especially, I'm always asking, well, well okay, fine, you had this ROC curve, and it was, it was statistically significant, but the box and whiskers overlap. Well, what's really important is the positive and negative predictive value. In this test, uh, for this t study, 96% of the Allosher uh, results from DART or from healthy, stable patients are below the 1% threshold. 50% of the samples from DART from healthy patients are below 0.21%, so very low down here. What it did have is it has a 95% negative predictive value. What does that mean? 
That's really practical. Say you have a patient who lives far away. It's going to be rough for them to get back for the biopsy. Or they're on Eliquis or, or Coumadin or some other anticoagulant. You don't want to biopsy them. So you get this Alisher test. And if it's less than 1%, you can pretty much say with a 95% positivity or negative positivity that they don't have rejection. Now, the positive predictive value is not as great, but that's because it depends on here, on, and it, uh, the positive predictive value is very much affected by the prevalence of, of, of your event. And on, in the DART study, it was a prevalence of about 10%, and that's what it is nationwide, right? That you see rejection occurs in about 10%. But the important thing is, what was that level? Well, it was up around 1.6%. So maybe that's where you might need to think about, if I see that, what should I do? And um, the next thing we want to do is sort out antibody-mediated rejection from T-cell-mediated. Because T-cell-mediated rejection can probably be treated with some steroids. That's another thing. Say the Alisher comes back at 1.6%, they're still on anticoagulation. Well, what do you do? Well, is it a T-cell-mediated or rejection, or is it antibody-mediated rejection? So you get donor-specific antibodies. And it turns out, and so that, the, that the Alisher helps discriminate between a DSA that is pathogenic or not. So we know that 50% of DSAs have no clinical relevance, and we can't figure out what they are. So to me, the Alisher helps that, sort that out. So 89% positive predictive value for antibody-mediated rejection in DSA. Now look below here where it says sensitivity of 50%. What that means is 50% of the people who had a positive DSA had, did not have antibody-mediated rejection, okay? So those of you who are monitoring for DSA all the time, 50% of the time you're getting data that's just misguiding you. So the other thing is, as we might expect, if the cell-free DNA is a measure of injury, we expect that antibody-mediated rejection has higher injury. And look, it does, 2.9%. So that's very helpful. So great negative predictive value, great positive predictive value for the type of rejection that we care about, antibody-mediated rejection. Of course, there's a whole other can of worms about how to treat that, which I don't think we really know right now. So we also looked at cell-free DNA and showed it was higher in the DSA-positive patients with the diagnosed um, antibody-mediated rejection. So that's in the red on the far left, 2.9% as opposed to DSA with no antibody-mediated rejection, 0.34%, or DSA negative. So this was presented by Stan Jordan at the ATC this year. So very, uh, very useful to discriminate a DSA that we could, should care about or a DSA that we don't care about. We also looked at the group analysis at the time of rejection, and you can see at the time of rejection, with biopsy-proven rejection, the Alisher is higher pretty wide, but the median was about 1.6% versus in the no active rejection. Again, you see some outliers here in the far right. That's important. Any test, no test is perfect. And there are other things, and I'll show you some of those other things that might uh, be pos re result in a high um, Alisher test. Some of them we just get other tests to try and discriminate that because this is not specific, it's just a way of showing injury. It's us to us to find out what kind of injury that there is. Two years ago now almost, I presented at the ATC in 2017, what happened to those follow-up Alisher tests? Well, you can see that in general, when they had rejection, active rejection, they were pretty high, around 1.9% on the far left graph, or uh, bar and whisker, by one month, it went down on, on median below, but by two to three months, it was down basically almost in everyone below the 1%. There were a few that it wasn't below 1%. Turns out that those were probably the antibody-mediated rejection that, as everyone knows, are hard to treat. So this is looking at those type of rejections now, and you can see on the far left, the cell-free DNA percentage was very low in a type 1A rejection. With type 1B, in the, at rejection, it goes up. With the rejection, goes down, maybe not completely, immediately. And with antibody-mediated rejection, it's high, but it stays high. So well, this can be useful, too, because so much with antibody-mediated rejection, we give phoresis, and we give IVIgg, and we give rituximab, and then we have to give the ambisome for the fungal infection we cause. So this might help us to say, hey, 
this is not getting better. Stop giving me this excessive immune suppression. And you can look at the creatinine, again, not very helpful. So now this uh, heat map, if you will, shows on the left why people got a biopsy uh, in the first place. So they got it for a clinical reason for a biopsy for high creatinine, proteinuria, DSA, DGF, uh, BK virus, and then the blue is below 1% and the red as higher levels are the higher percentage of cell-free DNA. And what you can see is the high creatinine, or if you look in the T-cell mediated rejection, it's a little bit, but all where the, in the middle group there, the antibody mediated rejection, that tends to be where it's higher. There can be some elevation with IFTA as well, grade one, so it might not sort that out, and you might need a biopsy to figure out whether or not you're going to do anything for chronic rejection. So the other thing is, if you look here on other diagnosis, BK sometimes can be elevated. How do you tell if it's BK or rejection? Well, in my world, if it's BK in the blood, it's BK, not rejection, because the biopsy can look like rejection. Actually, uh, 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 an abstract that I don't, uh, it will show later uh, suggests that the BK virus, if you do have nephropathy, you have higher cell-free DNA levels. So the key messages from DART are that the donor-derived cell-free DNA discriminates active rejection acute active antibody-mediated rejection from chronic active antibody-mediated rejection or T-cell-mediated rejection from no rejection with high accuracy. Donor-derived cell-free DNA is more accurate than serum creatinine in diagnosis of active rejection, and donor-derived cell-free DNA is highly sensitive in distinguishing antibody-mediated rejection from no antibody-mediated rejection. Deceased donor cell-free DNA levels decrease following rejection treatment that is effective. So let me say that. Deceased donor cell-free DNA levels decrease following rejection treatment when it is effective. So the cell-free DNA is a non-invasive test of allograft injury that may enable more frequent, quantitative, and safer assessment of allograft rejection and injury. And that was the conclusion we made from this study. Now, cell-free DNA can be used for a wide variety of patients, but not for everyone. So donor-derived cell-free DNA can be used uh, as now, and I put this in red, because originally it wasn't supposed to be used if the previous allograft in, is in place. Now we know from some of the data I showed you that it's okay. You can't use it yet in recipients of multiple transplanted organs. So you can't use it, unfortunately, in your simultaneous kidney pancreases, your simultaneous liver kidneys, your heart kidneys, or anyone else. You also can't use it if you have a monozygotic identical twin. I'm going to return to the importance of HLA matching and reporting uh, if you can, or at least relationship to the donor uh, when you try and get one of these tests because there are mathematical corrective factors that are used. You can't use it in recipients of allergenic bone marrow transplant because they have kind of chronic injury going on, and they have a lot of donor-derived DNA because that's what chimerism is and why you have a successful bone marrow transplant. In pregnancy, you've got another form of chimera, so you probably shouldn't use it there. It hasn't been tested yet in the under age of 18, and you can't use it less than two weeks post-transplant because it wasn't tested uh, rigorously in that group of patients, but those studies are ongoing. So what do you do if you want to get this test? Well, you can order it, and the samples are collected in a Streck cell-free DNA tube, BCT tube. These are these yellow or tiger-striped yellow tubes, and what they do is they stabilize the cells so they don't break apart and spill their, inner, inner, their innards so that you would get contamination of the plasma. These have been used for viral studies for years and are now being used in these. The samples are then shipped off in a kit at room temperature, no dry ice, to CareDX, which is a CLIA-certified lab and CAP-accredited clinical laboratory, and they'll get the results back to you within 72 hours. And on the right is an Alisher result. On the left panel, you can see the most immediate result, and it shows that that Alisher result was 0.81%. But you can also see the trend, and you can see the trend over the several. So you see it was very high at one time and almost excessively high at 16%. What was with that? Came down to 1.7, then down to very low, and then back up again. And that, this change might be important. 
because the change, there is always some variability with blood tests, but with this, there might be, um, if it changes by more than about 60%, you might have some concern. When ordering Alisher, these red sections need to be completed, and let me pay some attention to that. What you want to put is the transplant date, living related or not, and then choose if a living related donor what the relationship is because that affects how they model it. So uh, in terms of that, I told you that the modeling is based on SNPs, single nuclear polymorphisms, that differ. But you have less SNPs that differ if the closer the relationship is genetically. So if we look at this in a table and say, for instance, we say patient with sample 7. If they're unrelated, their Alisher was 0.9%. But there's a correction or a modifying correction factor up here. If that's a sibling, well, that's a correction factor of 2.25. So that would make it um, be reported out as a 2%. So you want to make sure that you report the relationship um, if you have so they get the correct interpretation. Because that 2% level, actually, if they're unrelated, that might be a normal level, and you might be um, acting on um, in, inappropriate uh, results. So, in conclusion, the use of cell-free DNA has been used for years to diagnose and monitor viral infection. The use of donor-derived cell-free DNA to help diagnose rejection and monitor response to treatment is new for transplantation. And there is a clinically available donor-derived cell-free DNA test to help predict, monitor, and diagnose active rejection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Tudeberg. He's an assistant professor of medicine and section chief of heart failure, cardiac transplantation, and mechanical circulatory support at Stanford University. He joined the Stanford faculty in July of 2017 after spending the prior 12 years at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He specializes in the care of patients with advanced cardiomyopathies, cardiac transplantation, and ventricular assist devices. He has particular interest in advanced heart failure and the transition to cardiac transplantation and ventricular assist devices. Dr. Tudeberg graduated from the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine in 1992 and remained at the University of Chicago for his internal medicine residency and general cardiovascular fellowship, during which he spent a year as the chief medical resident. Dr. Tudeberg received his heart failure and cardiac transplant training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He is currently president of the ISHLT Board of Directors. Dr. Tudeberg? Thanks, Linda, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the, the same topic, but in, in the heart world. I'm going to talk about two technologies. One is gene expression profiling, which has been around for a while, and the other one is cell-free DNA. And a lot of the sort of evidence and background is very similar to what you've already heard, so I'm going to confine the cell-free discussion to the last four or five slides and focus more on gene expression profiling. So these are my disclosures, including CareDx, which is the, the maker of gene expression profiling and, and the commercially available cell-free DNA technology as well. So I guess it's always worth starting by sort of asking the question, why do we really care? So we care because there are impacts of rejection on outcomes in all cellular organs, and heart is no different from, from kidney. So if you look at the ISHLT database and look at the number of patients who've had treated rejection in the first year, although the incidence of treated rejection is going down over the you know, course of the past 10 to 15 years, it's still reasonably prevalent. Somewhere between 10 and maybe 20% of patients will have at least one episode of treated rejection in their first year post-transplant. And most of these patients are treated uh, with a, a dose of steroids. They get three, you know, three doses of solumedrol over three days, and they tend to do fine. But even when they have that, it still impacts survival. So if you go back and also look at the ISHLT website and look at patients who survived to a year and ask among those patients who survived to a year, did they have an episode of rejection? And if they had no rejection, there was a blue line. If they had uh, one episode of, at least one episode of treated rejection, there's a red line. And you could say even one episode of treated rejection has an impact on survival over time. So that's why we care about it so much. And when you look at the cumulative incidence of death, you can see acute rejection in red. And, um, you know, it's not 
as if you don't get as much of it later on, it tends to be the incidence tends to be higher early on, but there's still incidence of rejection throughout the course of graft survival. So it's something that we care about over time as well. The only thing we've really had in heart transplants to look at rejection is endomyocardial biopsy. Unlike the liver guys, we don't have LFTs. Unlike the kidney guys, we don't have creatinine. So we've always done them. And when we do them, we tend to go through the right internal jugular or through the femoral vein up through the right atrium and tend to biopsy along the septum of the right ventricle because that's sort of the safest area to biopsy. But we have to do it relatively frequently. It's clearly invasive. We only get sort of a picture of one very small area of the heart, and we know that rejection can be patchy, so it might not catch it. It's clearly inconvenient. I'll talk about the variation and in interpretations of biopsy in the next slide or two. And patients really don't like them. Um, they, you know, it's just one thing, one more thing they have to do. They have to spend time waiting there and getting in the cath lab, and you know, makes them anxious and sometimes could be uh, fairly uncomfortable depending on who you are and how many biopsies you've had. We've looked at a lot of alternatives, and I just listed some of them there on the slide on the right, but none of them have really outperformed biopsy until recently. The other thing we don't really know about biopsying and surveillance in general is how long do you surveil people? This is data that was also based on uh, uh, the ISHLT database and looked at how long patients were surveilled, either indefinitely stopping doing, doing routine biopsies at five years or less than five years. And these are non-African American recipients because African American recipients tend to be higher risk. But when you look at this group of patients, there's really no difference for how long you've done surveillance, particularly long-term surveillance. And there's also a lot of variation, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, in what the pathologists look at when they see in the microscope and how they interpret that. When you look at uh, studies of, and look at local pathology versus the study pathologist, you can see there's some difference. When there's nothing there, I think everybody agrees that there's nothing there. But when there's something there, how much of something there is there can vary, different, vary a lot, even amongst uh, pathologists. If you look at the, 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 the chart on the right, if you look at the number of study pathologists who agree that there's no rejection, the local grade is zero, that happens almost all the time. But even when there is rejection, getting the study pathologist to agree that there is rejection, it doesn't happen all the time. It's fairly infrequent. So the, the, we think of the, the biopsy as the gold standard, but it may not really actually be that. It also costs a lot of money to do, to do biopsies as well, and we looked at the economic impact of doing biopsies when I was at Pittsburgh with one of my fellows. And we looked at the, the utility of stopping biopsies at 12 months versus uh, continuing them on to years two and three because that's what we did at the time in Pittsburgh. And no matter what rate of, of rejection you uh, assign to <clears throat> uh, asymptomatic patients, even when it's really unreasonably high, even as high as 50%, which is you know, clearly out of, uh, out of the realm of possibility from what we've seen from the ISHLT data earlier in my presentation, it's you know, just not cost-effective to do any sort of surveillance with biopsies past uh, 12 months. So it can also be very, very expensive as well. So it got us to asking, is there a way to find rejection or at least risk stratify people for rejection? And so that's where gene expression profiling comes from. And they collected mononuclear uh, cells that are circulating in the periphery of patients who are, who've had a heart transplant and looked at their gene expression. And they looked at the gene expression in people who had a rejection that was confirmed by biopsy and people who had quiescence, meaning no evidence of rejection. And when they compared the gene expression in, in those two groups of patients, they found 11 genes that tended to correlate the most with expression. And you can see the genes in the Alamap test listed in the left-hand column there, what they do in the middle column, and their expression in the setting of rejection. Now, not all these genes are, uh, are overexpressed in rejection. That's the green arrows. Some of them are actually downregulated in, in rejection, and those are the red arrows. And then there's another nine genes in the test. It has a total of 20 genes, but those are just used for reproduci reproducibility and standardization. So how do you get the score? So the score is from uh, 0 to, to 40. You can see the gene expression uh, the genes on the, on the left there, and then the middle part with the green and the red bars rep the, uh, the, in the middle there represents someone who has uh, uh, quiescence, who's not likely rejecting. And when you look at the, the gene expression pathways, the green bars represent their, those genes are expressed to look like someone who's not rejecting, and the, the size of the bar represents 
how much uh, the gene is expressed in that direction. And the red bars represent the genes that are expressed in the direction of someone who's rejecting. So even in the person in the middle there, or on the, uh, the, 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 right, the left hand two of, the left hand of those two pictures with the colors on them, you'll see that not all the genes are necessarily expressed in the same direction, but the preponderance of the expression is towards the green side where the person isn't looking like they're rejecting, so the score ends up being low. On the other side of, the, uh, of that is someone who looks like they are rejecting. So most of the gene pathways are expressed in a way that uh, looks like someone who's rejecting. So that person has a high score. So the value in gene expression profiling is that it is, has a high negative predictive value. So if you make a graph of all the people who have quiescence on their biopsy and then look at their gene expression profiling, you get the graph in green. And you can see that it forms a bell-shaped curve and that it's centered somewhere uh, on a low score, in this case about 20. If you look at all the people who are rejecting uh, on their biopsies and did their gene expression profiling, you see that that forms this distribution curve in red. And you can see that it's also centered on a much higher score. And so when we, when we get this, we look at a threshold test, or excuse me, a threshold score for the test. And that threshold is placed in an area such that below that threshold, you're very unlikely to be rejecting. So just in this picture here, if you put the threshold as this blue line, you can see that almost everybody who has scores below that blue line falls under this green distribution of scores that isn't rejecting. But all the, almost all the people who are above that uh, blue line, that's where all the rejectors live. However, there's still a lot of people here with these, the, uh, they're in this green that are part of this green curve that still aren't rejecting. So just because your score is above that threshold doesn't necessarily mean you're rejecting, but it puts you at higher risk. And so this allows us to take most of our patients who come to clinic who are asymptomatic, go for the biopsy, have normal filling pressures, maybe have a normal echo, and then have, end up having a biopsy that doesn't show anything. It allows us to spare all those patients' biopsies because they tend to fall below this threshold line. So how did we uh, get this into clinical use? So we did the image study. This was the first study that, that came out and was published in 2010. And that looked at about 1,300 uh, patients who were invited to p participate. About 600 of them were eventually randomized one-to-one uh, uh, -to, -one to either getting a biopsy like they normally do, or instead of a biopsy, they got gene expression profiling. They got their clinical assessments and echocardiography. And if you were in the gene expression profiling group, then you got a gene expression profiling score. And at the time that the trial started, there was only enrolling patients beyond one year. But as the trial went on and we got more comfortable using this, we started use, looking at patients who were below six months as well. But in the end, only about 15 or 20 percent of the patients were uh, less than a year after transplant. If your score was less than 34, which was a threshold, you kind of went back to clinic again and you didn't get a biopsy. If your score was above 34, then you got a biopsy. If you came to clinic, and you look like you're rejecting or your volume overload or we thought you had a high clinical suspicion of, uh, of rejecting, even if you were in the gene expression profiling arm, then you would go straight to biopsy. And the primary outcome you can see there is rejection with hemodynamic compromise, graft dysfunction, death, or retransplantation. So what did the outcomes look like? So in these two graphs, the routine biopsy arm is in the black, the gene expression profiling arm is in the red, and we looked at the freedom from that primary composite outpoint outcome that I showed you on the past slide, you can see that those curves pretty much overlapped one another, and there wasn't any difference between surveilling people with gene expression profiling and doing biopsies. When you just looked at pure survival, which is on the right, you can also see that there wasn't any difference in survival between those two groups. You can see that survival was really good. So recall that the gene expression profiling test had to be in patients who were clinically stable. If you look like you're rejecting or you just, you just got finished being treated for rejection a couple of weeks ago, these aren't the patients that we wanted in the trial. So the survival, you can see out to 800 days, is really, really good because these are patients who were relatively low risk. And so the image trial had already survived out to a year, so their overall survival was going to be better anyhow. So when that trial came out, more and more people started using it. It made it into the um, guidelines, particularly the ISHLT guidelines, but there still wasn't a lot of data. What happens kind of uh, before six months? How much can you use it? Because the test was indicated for use after about 57 days. So there was the e-image study, which was uh, a similar study to the 
image study, except it was at a single center. And the design looked a lot the same, except for now you include, could include patients from two to six months post-transplant. And if your gene expression profiling was from months two to six, the threshold score was different, so it was 30. And then after six months, it was the same as in the image trial, 34. And the pro patients were randomized the same way. They got gene expression profiling the same way, and they got biopsied if their scores were above threshold if you were in the gene expression profiling arm. And the co-primary outcome was also the same, this composite of hemodynamic compromise, graft dysfunction, death, or retransplantation. So the re end results looked about the same. I'm sorry that this produces a little bit fuzzy on, on, my, on my version here. So the endomyocardial biopsy is, curve is in the blue, the gene expression profiling curve is in the red, and there really wasn't any difference in the primary endpoint. If you look at each individual part of the primary endpoint, there also wasn't a difference in those. So similar results to the image trial. The other thing people asked is because this group of patients was early, earlier than the image trial, can you wean steroids? And the answer was yes. So when you look at the, this graph, the solid line is the gene expression profiling group, the dotted line is the biopsy group, and the y-axis was the milligrams of prednisone that you're on. And you can see that both patients groups ended up with the same dose of prednisone over time, so they were able to be weaned without any difficulty using this test versus biopsy. The other thing that we had some concerns about is, well, maybe if you use gene expression profiling and you don't use the biopsy, that maybe you're missing something that would cause an issue with long-term outcomes, and you would see that in IVUS. So IVUS is intravascular ultrasound. It's a way for us to look uh, very closely at the intima of the coronary arteries of our transplanted hearts. And we know that over time, small changes in the intima can represent uh, ongoing graft injury and lead to worse outcomes. But in this study, when you look at the IVIS sub-study, again, it wasn't big, only about uh, 15 to 20 patients in each arm. There really wasn't any difference in any of the IVIS parameters between the group that got gene expression profiling and endomyocardial biopsy. One other thing that think about and, uh, and keep in mind about this test is that unlike cell-free DNA, which uh, uh, you can draw the blood and put it in a tube and send it off to the, the central lab, it doesn't really require much processing. You do have to have some processing for this test. And so it can't be done in every lab that's sort of down the street where patients are getting their normal labs. So one of the things that we've done is set up lab draw stations sort of around the transplant center. You can see this is a map of the, of the Bay Area. And we're here down at Stanford where this red arrow is. The, bl the blacks, the circles of different colors, uh, with the exception of the bright red ones, are the zip codes of where our patients are coming from. So you can see the, kind of the blobs of where our patients sort of live around the Bay Area. Most of them live around Stanford, but some of them live uh, quite far away. And in the Bay Area, even when you don't live far away, sometimes it can take you a long time to get here. So we've established all these sites where patients can get their gene expression profiling drawn, these, these red dots that I'm pointing to, so the patients can get their regular labs drawn in addition to the gene expression profiling, and we know before they come to the clinic whether or not they, they're going to need a biopsy. The other thing that we've uh, looked at over time is, is there's something more to be learned than just whether or not the person's at low risk or high risk or higher risk for rejection. And so one of the things that we've started to look at is score variability. You can see this is sort of an example here, so patient Z has a lot of variability. Their scores are sort of all over the place, where patient S, patient stable, has lower scores but more stable scores. And does score variability tell us anything? Well, when we look at sort of large, uh, a large group of patients from the, from the image trial, uh, you can see that there's certain things that are clinical risk factors. One of them is race, one of them is age of transplant, and one of them is time post-transplant. So we need to keep those things in mind. But when you have those baseline risk factors, and that's what this column represents in this table, and then you add gene expression variability, and you might say, well, how do you determine variability? It's kind of a complex formula that, that they can calculate for you, but if you look in the tiny print down here, you can see what the formula is. But if you add that variability score, you can see that that significantly adds to the prediction of outcomes with a hazard ratio of about 1.7 to 1.8. If you just add the gene expression Gene expression profiling score, just the, the 0 to 40 you get, that doesn't really add anything. And if you just add whether or not it's above or below threshold, that also doesn't add anything. So there is maybe some additional predictive information from the variability of the test itself. 
you might say, well, we also get some biopsies and echoes. Does that add a, anything? And, and this model sort of looks at the same thing you saw in the past slide, but adds biopsies, past biopsies, and that doesn't really add much. And it also has the ejection fraction uh, from the local reading, and that also doesn't add much. So even in the face of all that information, the score variability for gene expression profiling can still add a little bit more information. Is there anything else we can learn about gene expression profiling? There is. There's a, a large database called OR, which is basically enrolling clinically a lot of patients who are managed with gene expression profiling. This was actually just published in the Journal of Heart Lung Transplantation this past month. And you can see there's about 1,500 patients that have been part of this database, uh, and there's many thousands of clinical visits. The, the overall characteristics, I won't go through these in, in gory detail, but they look a lot like our regular transplantations. They're not a whole lot different, not surprisingly. When you look at scores over time, we see the same trend, and we saw this with the original IMAGE trial as well, that the scores tend to go up a little bit after transplant and kind of plateau at about a year. And that's because some of these genes in the test are steroid-responsive genes. And so when, person, when people have had high doses of steroids, 20 milligrams or over, or a dose of steroids for something like rejection, it can really significantly affect the score. So patients shouldn't uh, be, in, uh, be surveilled with gene expression profiling when they're on 20 milligrams of steroids and within a couple of weeks of getting steroids for rejection. But when you look at the scores by race, you can see when you compare Caucasians versus other races, it looks about the same. It has the same pattern. When you look at the GEP score versus uh, endpoints, either death, the development of vasculopathy, uh, or a lie without uh, any vasculopathy, it looks about the same in, in those groups of patients. And then when you look at uh, death by other sort of causes from transplant, we also don't see an impact on uh, GEP scores from things like uh, cancer. When you look at just sort of outcomes over time, you see the survival. We saw the same thing that we saw in the IMAGE trial. The survival is very good because we're picking patients that we think are low risk. At the same time, when we look at sort of the general percentage of patients that are included in, in, in your transplant program for gene expression profiling, it's most of the patients, somewhere maybe 85 or even higher percent of your patients would be eligible for uh, testing with gene expression profiling. When you look at other outcomes like rejection with hemodynamic compromise, dysfunction, death, or retransplant, again, those uh, are relatively low. Over the course of uh, 10 years, only about 25% of those patients have one of those endpoints. When you look at the things like infections, uh, they're also low risk, but they still happen. Um, if you look at uh, the cumulative proportion of patients who have any infections, you can see that's this red line here. You can see after one year, about 20% of the patients in this group of uh, individuals followed with gene expression profiling have uh, an infection. But it's important to know kind of what type of infection, because people say, well, you know, if you have an infection, maybe your mononuclear, cell, mononuclear cells kind of start to look like uh, an, a rejection in terms of their gene expression. And that's not really the case. We found that most infections don't really impact gene expression profiling, with the exception of CMV. CMV is the one that consistently increases gene expression profiling scores. So we've kind of learned that if your gene expression profiling score is high and you do a biopsy and you don't see anything and it, it repeatedly remains high, then that may be a trigger to look for CMV, uh, even if the person's not having symptoms. The other thing we asked is, well, you know, are there any differences uh, based upon race or differences in gene expression, pro gene expression by race? Because we know there's other uh, differences by, across races in gene expression. And we're just starting to get this information now, and this was just submitted for uh, publication. When you look at uh, Caucasians in red and compare them to African Americans in blue and look at the freedom from death in the OR database, it's about the same. Uh, uh, over time until you get to a couple of years. But even in this group of low-risk patients, after a couple of years, African-Americans are at greater risk than uh, Caucasians uh, for death. And so then we asked, well, what if you looked at the individual genes? And is, are there differences in individual gene expression between African-Americans and Caucasians? And maybe we ought to be looking at uh, not only the overall score and maybe the score variability, but each individual gene expression. Interestingly, most of the gene expression uh, in the two groups was the same as you could, and I showed you a couple of slides ago, the scores are the same, and you can see that again here, uh, 
uh, between the differences in, and scores over time between Caucasians and African Americans wasn't different. But there are some gene expressions that are different. Uh, the, probably the most different one is the March 18. It is a uh, incre it, there's lower expressions in Caucasians, but higher expressions yield higher risk. And there's higher expression in African Americans, but that high expression isn't necessarily correlated with risk. So I think there's still much more to be learned from this test uh, and about the individual genes beyond the scores themselves. But looking at individual gene expression hasn't quite, hasn't quite hit prime time yet, so it's not part of clinical use of the test. So lastly, the last couple of slides, I'll talk about cell-free DNA. It works the same way it does in kidneys. Uh, this is a study, uh, or a, a study that was not yet published, but is submitted by my colleague here at Stanford, Karen Cush, and just looked at the OR database and measured cell-free DNA in those patients. And you can see it's generally pretty low, less than about 1% on, on most of these stable patients. When you look at um, people who are having rejection, which is this first box here. This is cellular rejection. Uh, I'm sorry, it projects a little bit fuzzy, but the patients who are having more se severe degrees of rejection have higher cell-free DNAs. Uh, this, bar should, this group should actually be labeled AMR, not mixed. I apologize, but you can see AMR is even more prominent in terms of the difference between patients who are having uh, AMR versus patients who are quiescent. And when you look at sort of all rejection and uh, uh, combining of the ACR and AMR, you can see the same thing with re mixed rejections tending to have the highest percentage of cell-free DNA. We're now uh, doing a study called the SHORE Registry, uh, which is offering a test called HeartCare, which is LMAP, which is gene expression profiling, and LSHORE. Uh, and looking at both those tests combined to follow heart transplant patients over time. And the way this is going to look is like, is like this. You can see that um, it, starts, it starts as early as uh, one month in terms of surveillance uh, for the cell-free DNA. It has to start a little bit later than that for gene expression profiling because it's not indicated uh, before a couple of months post-transplanted. And then we follow patients over time. So we can start uh, really non-invasively assessing patients within uh, two to four weeks after transplant. So, I think we'll be able to considerably, hopefully, cut down on the number of biopsies our patients are getting. So what are the conclusions from all this? Well, one, I think biopsies aren't going away. I think we'll still do them. They have their limitations, and we have to understand those limitations. But for people who aren't doing well or present with graft dysfunction, it's still very useful to do a biopsy. But I'm hopeful that they'll get less frequent over time, particularly the surveillance biopsies in people who are asymptomatic and have normal graft function on echocardiography. Gene expression profiling has been around for a while and it's part of our guidelines. Uh, it's proven non-inferior to biopsy in the IMAGE trial. I think it's most useful when it's part of a routine pro protocol rather than sort of used as needed or sort of uh, on the whim of the clinicians. Um, it, its value is in its negative predictive value, so who isn't rejecting, so who is at very low risk of rejection, so these are the patients in whom you can avoid a biopsy but it was only designed for cellular rejection, so it's not a, it's not a test for things like antibody-mediated rejection. So those who are at high risk of antibody-mediated rejection probably aren't uh, best followed by gene expression profiling exclusively. And there's a, a growing role for variability and maybe even some individual gene expression, but again, those aren't ready for prime time just yet. What about cell-free DNA? It's similar to the kidney data. We're still gathering data. The, the SHORE study is, is, is going to be enrolling here soon. I think the Stanford will be ready to go in the next uh, couple of weeks, and we'll have hopefully a little bit more data over the course of the next couple of years. But like was mentioned earlier, it's not just rejection. So it's any graft injury. So it could be acute cellular rejection. It could be antibody-mediated rejection. And in the, stand, in the case of heart, it could also be coronary vasculopathy. So, you have to kind of keep all those things in mind, and it's, it, can, it can be other things other than just ACR, like you would be looking at with gene expression profiling. We can get it as soon as two weeks post-transplantation. The reason why we can't get it much sooner than that is there's a fair amount of graft injury as a result of the transplant operation, and so patients in the first couple weeks have reasonably high levels of cell-free DNA, and it takes a couple weeks for those to settle down. But the nice thing about cell-free DNA is that uh, because you don't need as much processing, you don't necessarily need standardized draw centers like you do for gene expression profiling.
Lastly, I, you know, I think we're in the midst of a huge paradigm change. Um, I think in the past we were very comforted by negative histology and worried about cellular infiltrates um, when we're looking at things like rejection, but I think we're moving away from the biopsy as the gold standard. Like I said, I don't think it's going away. It's a great confirmatory test, and sometimes it helps us figure out uh, cases that are sort of in between. Um, but I think we're kind of not too far away from having a new gold standard, and that new gold standard will be uh, either gene expression profiling, cell-free DNA, or some combination of the two. And with that, I'm, I'll end, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions that there might be. Thank you, Dr. Tudeberg, and thank you, Dr. Brennan, as well, um, for such a great presentation. Uh, before I turn it back to Betty and Linda for questions, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for either of our presenters that you haven't submitted already, please go ahead and submit them using the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Also, for your reference, during the Q&A session, I will have this poll up. Um, for those of you who are listening in a group, please complete this poll to let us know how many people are listening in your specific group. And that being said, I'll turn it back to uh, Linda and Betty to moderate your questions. Thank you. Um, I have one question as we're waiting for our participants to put their questions up. Um, I have one question, and Dr. Tudeberg, you mentioned that with patients who are on even 20 milligrams of steroids, this one test may not be um, viable. Uh, a lot of heart patients are still on 20 milligrams of, of um, prednisone. So how do you get around that and make this test effective? Yeah, so for gene expression profiling, if they're on that 20 milli equivalents of steroids or, or, its, or its equivalent, then it's probably, it's probably best not to use this test. Uh, I think more and more sense, I think that when you look at the certainly results of e-image and, you know, my sort of anecdotal experience at, at Pittsburgh and here at Stanford, very few of our patients are at that level of steroids um, by the time the test, you can start using the test. So uh, we, we use it routinely here starting at three months post-transplant, and most of our patients okay. are on much, much less steroid than that uh, by three months okay. post-transplant. It doesn't affect cell-free DNA. And then one question from our participants was, um, how much does the test cost? And then my added question to that was, does insurance pay for this? So this problem. So I can answer. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. That'd be great. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead now. Go ahead, Dan. So I can't answer on the gene expression profiling. So I'm gonna. So I can only do the Alisher test for the cell-free DNA, and it's it's actually it's paid for for Medicare, but the cost to the patient is nothing, and yet the and the company if you have insurance, will bill the insurance, so the cost should not go uh, to the patient. The reimbursement rate for cell-free DNA um, through Medicare, the re Medicare reimbursement rate is, and I might goof this up, because suddenly I went blank. I think it's, I think it's uh, uh, $2,800. Uh, it might be even a little bit more, which sounds like a lot, but when you consider everything for a biopsy, if you add everything together, that's about $10,000. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say that's you know roughly the roughly the cost on the uh, on the heart side as well, and you know I think that it's it's also something that patients really really appreciate not having to get biopsies <laughs> because in in the heart world that that's all they were getting for years and years and you know I remember enrolling in the image trial it was the easiest trial I've ever enrolled in in my entire life patients were like falling all over themselves to get into the trial because. <laughs> They didn't because they didn't like the, the getting biopsies. So uh, exactly. I think that it's there's a huge there's a huge huge difference in, in terms of quality of life and 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 time for the patient when they go uh, when they get managed with these things rather than sort of routine biopsies on the heart side. We have um, one other question from uh, participant is that. 72 hours seems to be a long time to get results. How do you get results sooner, or how do you deal with it if it's taking that long to get the results back? So this is Dan. So I was in, uh, in um, St. Louis for 24 years, and uh, we followed people in you know a seven-state area. So 72 hours doesn't seem all that long. 
Uh, most rejections, you kind of, I mean, the typical approach would be someone's creatin was up, so there's the hydrate and repeat, you know, send off for some DSAs. And in the meantime, when you're doing all that, you could have been sending off for an Alisher. The flip side is when, what, when, when you decide that, oh, I can't wait for the Alisher, and they come in, and then they have a seven-unit uh, bleed after you do the biopsy, and you get the Alisher test, um, you know, in the afternoon because you had ordered it on Friday. And so that's very frustrating. I think there are patients where clearly it's, you know, the creatinine's gone from one to six, and you don't have a cause. You need to get in and do a biopsy. That's for sure. But then there, but the, for, I think for the most people, you really do have some, some time to, to, to think about this a little bit, to stop the anticoagulation, you know, if, they're gonna, if you think they're going to need the biopsy. So that being said, uh, CareDX is working on trying to get the turnaround uh, time faster. They are now running uh, and analyzing the tests now 24-7 so to, to reduce that. Okay. Yeah, and I would say on, on the heart side of things, you know, we're particularly for gene expression profiling, we're talking about patients who are completely asymptomatic, people who are doing fine, don't have dyspnea, normal graft function. So, you know, they just, what, the way we do it um, is that we have them get all their labs, including gene expression profiling, you know, in the week before they come to clinic. And if their gene expression profiling score is high, we let them know that they're going to need a biopsy. But remember, the way the test characteristic works is, even if the gene expression profiling score is high, they're still much more likely to not be rejecting than rejecting. It's just the yield of the biopsy is much higher. So I don't, I, we just kind of uh, look, at, look at the test beforehand. And so I don't look at 72 hours in, a, in someone who's having those symptoms that has a high gene expression profiling score as waiting too long. It's a, you know, the day their, their clinic is when they're going to get their biopsy anyhow. We're just getting the information a couple of days to, uh, to a week earlier so they can plan. Okay. Um, Deanna, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. So um, do you want to close this out? Yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to extend our sincere thanks on behalf of the Alliance to both of our presenters today, Dr. Tudorberg and Dr. Brennan. Um, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise on this topic. Um, and to all of our participants, I just want to thank you for your time and for joining us on today's webinar. And I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and your week.